Amen. Thank you, that Sister Emily. That was a blessing. If you have your Bibles, take it and turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter number 1. As always, I want to thank the Lord and Pastor for this opportunity to preach. Uh, always look for opportunities. Always look for opportunities. If you look for opportunities, generally they present themselves. And they told me, they always taught at college, you always got to be ready to preach, pray, die, and sing. If you do that, you'll pretty much fit in every church you'll go to. Um, but please do pray for our pastor tonight. I got a text from him during the service, and he's preaching tonight down in Tennessee. So be in prayer for him. Uh, of course, um, I'll be preaching tonight, but he'll be preaching down there. So keep him in your prayers, if you will. I meant to mention it earlier, but uh, just, just keep him in your prayers tonight and also this week. And then Brother Payne shot me a text as we were praying, and I wanted to mention something as well, that he found out right before the church that his uncle is in hospice. His name is Ernest Payne, and we'd appreciate the church praying for him. So uh, let's be in prayer for him as well. Have you found Hosea yet? It's just a small little book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark... Luke, Hosea, yeah. it's right there. Um, some of y'all are looking there right now. No, it's in, it's in the Old Testament, uh, one of the minor prophets. Let's all stand as we read just a few verses here. Book of Hosea, Hosea chapter number one. We'll read a few verses in Hosea chapter one, then we'll jump over to Hosea chapter two. And let's start off Hosea chapter one, verse one. I'll read it aloud. Just read it silently in your seats. The Bible says, the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. Now I want you to look over the second chapter, chapter number 2, and go to verse, start verse number 4. The Bible says, And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they will be children of whoredom. For their mother hath played the harlot, that she conceived them, hath, uh, she that conceiveth them hath, uh, hath done shamefully, and she said, For I will go after my lovers, and give me my bread, and my water, my wool, and my flax, mine oil, and my drink. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so very much, Lord, for your goodness to us, for giving us a, a building, Lord, we can meet in, and Lord, for, the, for your people that have taken time out of their schedule, Lord, to come and make the house of God a priority in their life. Now I pray, Father, that you would Help me, Lord, as I preach, Lord. You've given me a great thought for several weeks now, and I pray, Lord, that I would be able to get it off of, off of my mind and out of my mouth the way that you gave it to me. May, Lord, someone leave here and challenged and encouraged. Lord, if there be someone today who does not have a personal relationship with you, may tonight, during the preaching after the service is done, may they bow their head and trust you as their Savior, that they might have a personal relationship with you in this very night. Bless now, Pastor, as he preaches down south. And the preaching of your word here at Calvary, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so very much for standing. Hosea is a book in the Bible that many people have never read. It, it doesn't quite go along with the same flavor of a Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not quite the same history books as a Genesis and an Exodus. It falls into the minor prophets, and the minor prophets aren't minor in importance, obviously. They're, just, they're minor as, as in their length is a little bit shorter and where they're placed in, in the canon of Scripture. They're major prophets, there's minor prophets, and the minor prophets are kicked off by a prophet named Hosea. Now, if you know anything about Hosea, we read a little bit about him. God used him to be a picture of Israel's relationship with God. See, Hosea was a man of God, and God came to Hosea and said, I want you to do something very unique, something that, that, that no one else in the history of the Bible was ever recorded doing. He said, I want you to go out, and I want you to go and find a harlot. I want you to find a woman of whoredom, as the Bible says, and I want you to marry her. I want you to go find an unfaithful woman, and I want you to marry her. Now, to most any of us, that seems like a bad idea. If you, if you know anything, if you've been married for any length of time, if you've been married for about two years now, you want a wife, you want a husband, ladies, that's going to be faithful to you. You don't want someone that's, that you can't trust, you can't depend on. And Hosea found a woman of Horeb. Now, 
this wasn't just any woman. This woman's name was Gomer. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, Gomer Pyle did it in for me, because now I'm picturing a woman with a goofy grin and a comb over, and that does not look good in my mind. So I don't know who ruined it for who, if Gomer ruined it for Gomer or which way it went. But anyway, he finds a woman, a harlot named Gomer, and he marries her. The Bible talks about them having children, but the Bible does say that she was unfaithful in that relationship as well. You see, God had, had chosen his people. You go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. He's chosen Israel to be his people. I mean, he showered down blessings upon the Israelites. He showered down his love upon the Israelites. If the Israelites needed protection, if they needed providing for, God took care of them. If there was anyone who didn't have a reason to go off and chase after false gods that didn't exist, chase over false idols that couldn't do a thing for them, it was the Israelites. It was the one who was true, true, who were following the one true God. And yet, as we see, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find that the Israelites, they get into this cycle. It's like a crazy cycle. They'll, they'll go and they'll follow God for a time, and then they'll go after other gods, and God will, will rebuke them. He'll send a judge their way. He'll send a prophet their way. He'll, he'll send them into captivity, and they'll repent, and then they'll get out of captivity. God will deliver them, and it starts all over again. Doesn't that sound a bit like the Christian life? Just when you think you got it going on, just when you think you have something figured out, something comes right along, you get filled up with pride, you, you fall into a sin, you step into a sin that you didn't think, that you thought you had conquered, you thought you had licked in the past, and something comes up that challenges your Christian life. That's exactly what the children of Israel were like. And God said, this happened over and over and over and over again. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give Israel a picture of what they are doing to me. Hosea, you are going to be the picture of God. You are going to take this woman, you're going to love this woman, you're going to be faithful to her no matter what she does to you. But I know she's going to leave you. I know she's going to be unfaithful to you. And that's exactly what happened. We read in the Bible that, that Gomer was unfaithful and she went out and, and, and went back into her routine of, of going from man to man to man while Hosea stayed faithful from all accounts of Scripture. Can you imagine people coming by Hosea's house and, and, and seeing everything he's been going through and saying, Oh, Hosea, I'm so sorry that you have to deal with this. I'm so sorry that, that I mean, you've been so faithful and she has been unfaithful. And Hosea points his bony finger back in their face and said, That's exactly how God feels when you start running away from him. Yeah. That's exactly how God feels when you start whoring after these other gods. You are playing the adulteress to the true God. Yeah. Hosea was the picture there. And I began thinking, you know what, can you imagine how God felt when he saw his people continually going back into the cycle? Now, this wasn't a God who'd been unfaithful to his people. Maybe we could understand if God had in the past been unfaithful, but God was always faithful. Maybe we could understand if this was a God who had been unloving, but this is a God who had always been loving. Maybe we could understand if this had been a God who had been apathetic, but this has been a God who's always cared. And yet, this is the same God who had been nothing but good to them, and they turned away. Let me say, to put things into, you say, Brother Caleb, this is Old Testament. Well, let me, let me transfer this over. Let me segue this over into our lives. When you got saved, you started a personal relationship with the true God of heaven. I'm not talking that you just got, you got a scratch-off lottery ticket. I'm not talking that you just got a brand-new car. I'm not talking you just got something that was pretty cool, maybe a collector's item. You got a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm talking you now know your creator, and your creator now knows you. You went from the bottom of the pile to being a winner by a mile. You went from the bottom of the dunghill to now being placed in high places, in, in heavenly places, and having all the riches to look forward to that are God's as well. We see that we have been placed into a, a very unique relationship. And I want to say this while I'm on it. I've heard people say before, oh, well, we're all children of God. It sounds so good. We're all sons of God. We're all daughters of God. Well, my Bible says yours does too in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Oh, it may sound good. Oh, we're all children of God. We're all children of God. We're all creations of God, for sure. We all certainly have that in common. But if you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not a child of God. You're still lost and off on the world, but you must come to him by faith. You say, oh, I want to have a relationship with God. I want to get to know him. I want, I want to have that personal sonship to, to my Heavenly Father. And you can. You see, that's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross 
He shed his blood. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. He looked ahead in time. He saw that you were going to be living. He said, I don't want them to have to die for their sins. So here's what I'm going to do. All the way back from the Garden of Eden, sin has separated us from God. Sin separated our relationship with God. It had, to be, it had to be bonded temporarily during the Old Testament through the sacrifices of, of the bloods of goats and sheep. But he came as the perfect lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. One time, died on the cross, it's done. That's why Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. The word there is tetelestai. I love that word, tetelestai. It's what they would do on a, a contract when it had been paid in full. They would take a stamp on it and stamp tetelestai. There's nothing more that needs to be paid. Not one red penny that needs to be paid more. It has been paid fully. That's what he did for you and for me. Why? So that we can have a relationship with him. Oh, so often we, we, get, we get our minds fixated on, on heaven, and I think of heaven often. I think of heaven almost every day, and, and, and I, I, I think most people would agree with me, we're looking forward to heaven. Right. We're looking forward to the streets of gold. We're looking forward to the gates of pearl. We're looking forward to seeing God. We're looking forward to seeing our Savior. We're looking forward to seeing loved ones that have gone on before us that we'll see up there again. We're looking forward to no more pain, no more sickness, and that'll be a wonderful time. But sometimes we get so fixated on heaven that we forget about our now relationship with God. You see, God didn't just save you so he could have a relationship with you once you get to heaven. God saved you so you can have a relationship with him now. He wants, to get to, he wants you to get to know him now. He wants to spend time with you now. He wants to spend time with the Israelites when, when, in their day and age as well. But let me say this. When you got saved, he saved you for a purpose. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to have fellowship with you just as he did with Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden. But let me say this tonight. If you are here and you don't have a relationship with God, that's not something you'll ever see. Oh, oh, it's, it's, it's so sobering to think. One day we're all going to die and we're all going to stand before God. And the only way that we can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it when he was here on earth in John 14, 6. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Oh, if you're here today, say, Brother Caleb, I don't know if I've ever had a relationship with God. I don't know if I've ever started that relationship. Well, if you don't know for sure, you probably haven't. If, if there's any doubt in your mind, I'd get that settled tonight. I wouldn't risk going to heaven or going to hell. I wouldn't risk that on anyone or anything. I wouldn't risk that on my own pride. I wouldn't risk that on, on someone else's profession of my salvation. I got saved when I was just a little boy. I got saved when I was seven years old, almost, almost eight, right before my eighth birthday. And the preacher was preaching on hell. And he was, he, was, he was talking about it, and I could see it in my mind. I could see it in my mind's eye, and, and, I, and I knew. I fell under such deep conviction. I knew that I wasn't saved. I knew I didn't have a relationship with a heavenly father, and it, it, it convicted me. I knew that there was something missing. I knew that there was something wrong. And, and a couple years before, I'd, I, I had someone told me that I got saved. Someone told me that I'd, I'd prayed the prayer. And all I remembered about it was that I got baptized, but I didn't remember that I got saved. I couldn't take you back to the place. I couldn't take you back to the time. And I waited and, and clenched the front of the pew in front of me. The, the, altar, the altar call was given. The invitation was given. And, and, and I, I thought in my mind, my parents, are, they're, they're so involved in the church. And, everyone, and I've already told everyone that I'm saved. So I'm, I, that's my story. I should probably stick to it. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me get any victory over that. I sat wrenching on that, on that pew in front of me. And the preacher started praying to end the invitation. I knew I couldn't take it anymore. I ran over to my mom, who's sitting right down the pew from where I was, and said, Mom, I need to get saved. Amen. I need to get saved. I'm not saved. I, I, know, I know for sure that, that if I died today, I'd split hell wide open. And that's not worth my pride. That's not worth anything. I need to go to heaven. And now I can take you to the place. I can take you to the spot. I can take you to the time when I bowed my head, I bowed my heart, and I asked Jesus to save me. Amen. And that day started a relationship with my heavenly Father. I began to think about other relationships in my life. I mentioned it earlier, but about two years ago, almost two years ago, we're coming up in this next month, June 17th, 2017, I stood on this very platform and watched as the most beautiful woman in the world came right down this aisle in her white wedding dress and 
we started a relationship. Beyond being boyfriend, girlfriend, beyond being fiancés, we became husband and wife. Start a brand new relationship. And let me say this for the young people's benefit here. The devil in the world will tell you it's impossible to get married pure in this day and age. They'll say that this is, this is how it's going to go down. If you watch television, if you watch movies, if you, if you listen to songs, this is the way they'll encourage you to go. You, you first, you find someone that you like, probably at a bar or somewhere that's kind of a little shady. Then you, then you, the, you hook up with them. Then you have to, you have to, you have to sleep with them or, or do something, something intimate with them. Then you have to move in with them after a certain amount of time. And then after you do all that, maybe consider getting married. That's what the world will, will encourage you to do. But that's not what my Bible tells me. You see, my Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. My Bible says that until you marry, you keep your hands off. And that works both ways. That's God's plan. That's not my plan. That's not Brother Caleb's plan. That's the way God said to do it. And God knows you because he made you. He knows what that touch does to you. He knows what that touch does to that person as well. That's God's plan. So let me just encourage you. I'm not telling you this because I've read it somewhere. I'm not telling you this because I saw a survey somewhere. I'm not telling you this because, because I think it might be true. I'm saying you can stay pure until your wedding day because I did as well. Can it be done in the year 2019? Absolutely. It can be done in the year 2017 for not just myself but for my wife as well. It's possible. And by the way, all those people that would be encouraging you to go out and get rid of your purity... They can never be what you are. They can never get back their purity that you have. You have something very, very precious. Don't lose it. But we got married almost two years ago, coming up on our second anniversary. We stood up here, and I went back and I actually watched the footage of it over today. Um, Mrs. Mel, she, she was able to record it for us and did an absolutely amazing job. Um, I got to go back and watch it today, and... I got to watch our wedding vows again. And I love that because you, when you enter into a new relationship, there's always a commitment that comes with it. And those wedding vows were, were that glue. They were, that, they were that, that, that promise to one another that keeps our marriage running. We said something pretty much to the, to the tune of this. I commit to love her, to honor her, to keep her, in sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth, and forsaking all others, give the only to her as long as we both shall live. And you know, there's only one right answer to that. And if you don't know the answer yet, you probably shouldn't be getting married yet. But I looked her in the eyes and said, I do. And to this day, I still do. You know why? Because there's a commitment there. There's a new relationship forming, and that new relationship is based upon a commitment. The title of my message tonight is simply this, The Commitment of Relationship. You see, I began thinking about it, and every relationship you have in your life has a degree of commitment attached to it. You say, well, what about a friendship? Well, a friendship uh, requires trust. It requires trust that your friend won't be secretly trying to harm you behind your back. I went back to the, the story of David and Jonathan back in 1 Samuel chapter 14. So, and I looked at how many times uh, Jonathan, if he wanted to, he could have stabbed David right in the back. He could have come right behind David, told Saul exactly where he was, and have his, had his friend, his friend killed. David had to trust Jonathan. Oh, friendship, it takes trust. What else, does, what else does, re, was, does friendship require? Well, it requires time. Time that keeps you from falling distantly apart. Proverbs 17, 17 talks about that. Um, it requires friendliness. Uh, the Bible talks about the iron sharpeneth iron. And the, 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 the friend, he sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. It, it's, it, the Bible says so much about friendship. It talks about so much about what it requires. And for you to be a friend to someone, it takes some degree of commitment on your part. Yeah. Marriage requires commitment. We just talked about that. It requires trust that your spouse will not be unfaithful. It requires patient love through the thick and thin. It requ requires respect that doesn't belittle. It requires so much more than that, but you get the idea. It's a commitment. It requires a commitment with it. You talk about a father-son relationship. If you go to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, we won't for sake of time, but it talks about the commitment between a son and his father. It talks about children obey. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. What is that? That's a commitment. That's a son's commitment to his father. 
It's not just obedience, and I talk about this in junior church a lot. It's not just obedience, but it's obedience with the right attitude. It's, it's submitting to authority with the right attitude, with the right spirit. Right. And while I'm on it, we have a heavenly father. Yeah. And we have his words. We have his commands that we are to obey. But not just to obey, to obey with the right attitude. Right. Right. If the Bible says it, it's not just enough to say, fine, I won't tell a lie. Fine, I won't take that because stealing is wrong. That's not honoring our father. It's obeying with the right attitude. But the Bible also gives something for the fathers as well. It talks about nurturing and training without provoking to wrath and bitterness. But for the few moments we have remaining, I want to talk about the relationship between us and God. You see, there's certain things that that relationship requires of us. A commitment to our relationship. There's many more in the Bible that I won't cover tonight. You, as you go home, I encourage you this week in your devotions, be looking for them because they're all throughout Scripture. But tonight I want to cover just four things. What's required in our relationship with our Father? Number one, to love. The Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Pastor talked about it this last Sunday and mentioned it at staff meeting before, how, how so many churches will go the way of, of just preaching God's love for us. And certainly God does love us, but they'll emphasize that and they won't tell anything about us loving God. Yeah. Say, oh, well, it's, it's enough that God loves you and just make you feel good. Let me, let me just itch your ears a little bit and make sure that you feel all right so that when you go home you want to come back the next week. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we ought to love God because he first loved us, but we still ought to love God. God's love for us isn't in question, friend. If you look in the Bible, if you start reading your Bible for five minutes, you'll realize that God's love for us is not in question. All you have to do is think of John 3.16, and God's love is not in question. I wonder if some people who are still questioning the love of God are spending time in the Word of God, because you can't spend much time in the Word of God and not realize God loves you. If you haven't gotten your Bible reading in this week, I'll help you. God loves you. It's all throughout Scripture. That's not the problem. That's not the question. The question is, how much do we love him? You see, the Bible says, God said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. If you know the story, someone comes to Jesus and asks, what's the greatest commandment? In all of scripture, in all of time, what is the greatest commandment? And this is what Jesus told him. Love the Lord thy God. And I thought that his response was very interesting here. Because he mentions three different areas. If you go to another passage of scripture, he had strength in there as well, with all thy might. But I want to look at those three real fast. He says, with all thy heart. Your heart is the seat of your emotions. Sometimes you'll see around here a singer, and, and as they're singing the song and thinking about the words, a tear will, drop, will run down their cheek, or they'll raise their hand. Why? What, what's, what's going on there? Jesus is in the seat of their emotions. They realize, I have a big God. I have a God that's touched with a feeling of my infirmities. I have a God that knows exactly where I am. He has my address and he has my phone number. He knows what I'm going through and I can trust him. Maybe thinking back to the day you got saved. The day where you trusted Jesus as your savior. And a tear runs down your cheek realizing that if you had not made that decision, you'd be bound for a devil's hell. Oh my goodness. God wants your hearts. He wants the seed of your emotions. We get emotional about all kinds of things. We can get emotional about Hallmark movies. We can get emotional about a, a football game or a basketball game. We can get emotional about, about something that goes on in our life. We, we, we win a contest. We win a prize. And that's woohoo! That's awesome. But where's your emotion to the things of God? I'm not about, and I know pastor isn't about this either. I'm not about this, this hard, stern Christianity. Bless God. I'm glad you're here in church today. Never show any emotion. Just stone-faced. Oh, we must, we, must, we, must, we must not show any emotion toward the things of God. No, God wants your emotions. Amen. He wants your hearts. He doesn't want just, and by the way, he doesn't just want part of your hearts. He wants all of your hearts. Yeah. Amen. See, God, when he died for you, it is finished. Paid in full. You know, he bought all of you. He didn't just buy some of you. He didn't just buy whatever part you're willing to give up to him. He bought all of you. The Bible talks about many times about, about serving the Lord, loving the Lord, worshiping the Lord with all of your heart. And that's what he says here. I want you to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. What's the second one? With all thy soul. You know what your soul is? Your soul is your human will. It's your desire. 
It makes up who you are and what you want. So many times we desire things. And, and that's one thing I believe that the devil has taken away from us here in American prosperity is he's found out one thing. He can take away more from the church in, from prosperity than he ever could for, through persecution. Because prosperity will make us apathetic to other things. Oh, we have so much. We're self-sufficient. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we're good to go. Without realizing we still need to rely upon him. He wants your desires. He wants your wants. He wants your heart, but he also wants your soul. He wants you. He wants the full package. Often, we desire things for ourselves. We desire things to be consumed upon our own lusts instead of seeking to desire things that we can then turn around and use for his glory. Where are our desires tonight? Oh, how many times I've been guilty of this myself. Guilty of, of wanting so much and, and creating this big long wish list of things that I can use. And this will pleasure me. This will make me feel better. This will put me in a better social standing. Without thinking, God, what do you want? What do you want me to have? How can I use this for your honor and glory? It talks about your desires. All your hearts. All your soul. But lastly, with all thy mind. You see... Your mind's the center of your thoughts. There's so many times as a Christian, I know, grew, growing up in church, I was guilty of this as well. You don't necessarily do something wrong, but you think about it. You don't say something mean, but you think about it. You don't, you don't act upon your thoughts, but they're there. He wants your thoughts too. He said, it's not enough that you just love me with all of your, with all of your, your decision making, with all your desires. It's not just enough that you, 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 um, you love me with all, of, with all of your heart, with all of your, your soul. I want your mind as well. Your mind is, is so integral to your relationship with God. All those thoughts that pass through your mind. I've, I've read so many surveys ranging how many thoughts go through your minds on a daily, on a daily basis. And it's incredible. Your mind is constantly thinking. Even when you're asleep, your mind is constantly working, constantly thinking about different things. But does God have your thoughts? Are your thoughts on things of Him, about things of you, of things of others? He said, I want you to love you with all of those. All those thoughts. And how often we fail to do so. So we see, number one, we're committed to love God. And not just love Him haphazardly. Love them with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. Secondly, it's a commitment to obey. John 14, 15, and 21, Jesus says, if ye love me. Isn't that funny how it ties in love? The first thing that we're required to do, the first thing we're committed to do in our relationship, he ties in with the second. He said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. He went on to say, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is. That loveth me. You see, God looks down on your life every once in a while. He always sees what you're doing. Of course, because he's God, he's omniscient, and he's, uh, he, he's omnipresent. He's, he always sees what you're doing. But he looks down on your life, and he gauges your love for him by your obedience to his word. He looks down and says, well, well, I, I, know, I, know, brother, I know brother so-and-so, he's been, he's been reading his Bible, and I know he, he, was, he heard the preaching about this, uh, this certain topic at Sunday, and in Sunday school, and, and during the preaching, but he's not obeying it. Right. But he just stood up and told everyone that he loved me. But he's not living that he loved me. He, he just told everyone that, that I meant the world to him, and yet he's not obeying my word. Oh, oh she, she, she talks a good game. But she's not living a good game. It's not about the words that we speak. So, so often we think, oh, well, if I, if I praise God, if I, if I say it with my mouth, then that's all that matters. But it's not. It's about what we do as well. They say, there's an old saying, talk is cheap. It's actually free. You can say whatever you want to say. But to act upon it, that's a whole different ballgame. Some of us can talk a good talk. If we're honest with ourselves, if we're honest before God... We can talk a good talk. We can walk a good walk. But are we obeying God's word? Oh, our obedience to him. Your, and let me say this. Your relationship to God, to the God of the Bible, will be directly affected by your obedience to the commands of the Bible. 
You say, I, I, I miss that place of close fellowship with God. I miss that place where, where it's just so sweet. And I, I wake up in the morning and I'm excited to read my Bible. And, and I have that, that, that sweet fellowship. I miss that. Let me ask you this. How obedient have you been to him? I find in my life, and maybe you can attest to the same, the time I'm walking in knowledgeable disobedience to God is the time I won't want to spend much time around that world. Right. I don't want to spend much time around the people of God. I don't want to spend much time around holy things. Why? Because I look in the mirror of the scriptures and find myself guilty. But it's obedience. Oh, a commitment to God and a relationship with him is to love. It's to obey. Thirdly, it's to reverence. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, verse 24, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. Oh, it's so important that we reverence God. You, you realize that God didn't have to send his son to die. He wasn't obligated to do that for you because you are somebody. He did it because he loves you. He did it because he reached down his hand. He saw you and your need for a savior and was willing to sacrifice his very own son to do so. Psalm 2 writes about serving the Lord. He says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Sometimes it's important to get our eyes off of who we are and see him for who he truly is. Isaiah saw that. If you go to the book of Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 6. You read about Isaiah and his encounter with God. He, he realized who God was. He said, woe is me. I am undone. When you see God for who he truly is, when you get your eyes off of yourself and off of your own problems and see God for who he truly is, it changes your perspective. But it's a commitment in our relationship, not just to love, not just to obey, but to reverence him, to see him for who he truly is. And lastly, and I'm done, it's a commitment to be faithful. We see in the story of Hosea how Hosea took a wife unto himself that was not faithful. We see in, in 2 Chronicles 19, and he charged them saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a pure heart. You know, the Bible says a lot about faithfulness. And you know what's interesting? Most of the time where God talks about faithfulness, or the Bible talks about faithfulness, it's talking about the faithfulness of God. You go through there, and I would say easily two-thirds, if not three-fourths of the times it mentions the word faithfulness, it talks about great is thy faithfulness. You know, God is so faithful to you. Every single morning, his mercies are anew. Every single morning, he's faithful again. You don't have to wake up this morning and say, I don't know if God's going to be faithful. You wake up, and God is faithful. He has been faithful, and he will be faithful. And you know what I think is interesting? I think it's interesting how when Jesus was giving the parable, he gave a parable of, of the stewards, and how the, the master gave his stewards different amounts. And maybe you recall the parable as well, that, that earthly story with the heavenly truth. And he, he mentioned the stewards. He said, I was going to give you so much money, and he left for a period of time. And he came back and he, he, he required an account of those stewards. He said, I want you to tell me what you did with the money that I gave you. What you, what you did with the talents that I gave you. And there were some stewards that, that did exactly what he wanted. They went and they took it and they doubled it. They multiplied it and gave it back to him. But you know what I think is very interesting? We, we see this as a parallel between not just a, a physical man and a physical a steward. But we see it as a parallel of our lives as well. See, God's given us everything that we have, even our very bodies and even our very health. He's given us everything that we have, and one day we're going to stand before him and give an account for everything that he's given to us. And when we stand before him, we're going to either show him that we've done something with it or that we've wadded it up in a napkin and kept it to ourselves. And though that's another message in and of itself, look at what the master's response was to the good stewards. The Bible says in Matthew 25, 21, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful steward. I read that and thought, Well, why didn't it just say, Thou, thou, thou good and diligent steward? Certainly, the, the steward was diligent. He, he did his work and he, he, he worked hard at it. Maybe, maybe a good and hardworking servant. Maybe that's what he's looking for. Maybe good and obedient servant, because the, the servant was certainly obedient. But what stuck, out, what stuck out to the Lord, what stuck out to the master, was faithfulness. What stakes out to our God is faithfulness. What God's going to look at our lives and measure it by 
is faithfulness. When God sets us before him and, and he starts going over our entire life and, and, and the Bible talks about he's going to strike a match to it and, and some things will be wood, hay, and stubble and those will all be consumed and some things will be, will be the, the gold and silver and the precious stones and those things will be refined. When you stand before God, what he's looking for is faithfulness. He looks at your life and says, have you been faithful? Have you been, have you been faithful to me? Have you been faithful to reach souls for Christ? Have you been faithful to my word? Have you been faithful to, to, to be a blessing to others? Or have you been unfaithful? He said, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, my goodness. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. When God looks at your life, does he see faithfulness? Does he see faithfulness to the house of God? Does he see faithfulness to the things of God? I, I look back in the Bible, and, and w- the verse we always associate with church attendance and with being faithful to the house of God is, is the verse that talks about uh, us not being uh, us um, uh, not going out and not and forsaking the assembling ourselves together as, as a manner of some is. And during that time, the reason why they would forsake the house of God was because of the religious persecution in their day that was so great, if they were associated with Christianity, they could be killed on the spot. They had, if we could say it this way, they had a legitimate reason why they would miss church. They were scared for their own lives. They were scared for their own well-being. They were scared for their families. They were scared for other people that could be taken away from them and bodily harmed. And we miss church Again, why? You know, I firmly believe after the first hundred, thousand, you know, who, who knows how many years in heaven, we're going to cross paths with some of these martyrs. Yeah. Some of these people who were legitimately killed for their faith. And we're going to have a nice little conversation with them and, and get to talk about their story. And they're going to tell us how, well, we were meeting in church one Sunday and, and men came in and, and they, they asked if we were Christians and they took us out and, and they beheaded us all. And that's why I'm here in heaven today. They'll turn to us and say, what's your story? Amen. What, what, what great things did you do for the Lord? You weren't, wait, you weren't in church Sunday, why? You, you, you missed for a ball game? You, you missed because you had something more important to do? We're going to stand before them, we're going to be standing ashamed. Why? Because we refuse to be faithful. Faithfulness to the things of God. It's part of our commitment to him. To be faithful. In conclusion, your relationship to God is your responsibility. I can't do your relationship with God for you. Each and every one of us have a relationship with God that we have to maintain on our own. I dare say that most of us have experienced seasons of our relationship with God that have been better than it is right now. Seasons when we were closer to God than we are right now. Seasons when fellowship was sweeter with God than it is right now. But you know what? If you want to get back to that place, you have to start by getting back to your commitment to God. Commitment to that relationship. Brother Replogle and I were talking earlier, and we were getting each other fired up before the chapel message this morning. And he said, imagine this. Imagine if you you went off and, and, and married your wife, but then after you got married, you went off and you started going and, and sleeping with other women and start, you know, staying around with other women. And, and you, you started a relationship, absolutely. You're unfaithful to it. How would your wife feel about that? Or if I went out and, and I treated her absolutely like, like a princess for one day. One day a week, I, I went out and I, and I absolutely, I went all out and I, and I got her breakfast in bed and I, and, I, and I got her all kinds of nice things and I, and I treated her so well, but then the next night I was nowhere to be found. The next week I was nowhere to be found. That's what happens when we only serve God one day a week. I'm talking about a commitment to a relationship. If you have a relationship with God tonight... His commitment to you is unwavering. My question to you is, how is your commitment to him? With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Lord, you're truly better to us than we are to you. And Father, I stand tonight humbled to see how much you love us, how much you are faithful to us.